One thing that drives me absolutely insane is when I have so much on my workbench that I can't actually do work on my workbench. So today we're going to work on solving that problem. And while we're at it, I also want to make a better system for my sustainers and close a very important workshop tool, use some of the wood that I just had to hold on to, and finally make a good place to sit at on a stool. But first, let's cover some quick workshop layout challenges that got us here in the first place. I liked having my workbench under this window for the longest time. It lets in a lot of light and it's just convenient to use the back of this wall this way. The issue is, is that this corner is a little bit hard to get to and this workbench location isn't super conducive for filming projects. The next logical thing to try is putting it underneath the others. This certainly solves for the hard to reach corner cabinet, but presents the same issues for filming and then there's this weird dead space underneath the window. And that's why I've landed on my workbench being relatively in the middle of my workshop, serving double duty as an outfeed table for my table saw. Of course, this presents some different challenges because now this corner is going unused and it isn't great for anything that requires infeed or outfeed, which in fact is most tools. So with all of that in mind, I decided to go with an L-shaped counter in the corner that would act as a landing zone for those random tools house my sustainers, enclose that important shop tool, and generally be the storage space for all of my most used hand tools. I started in SketchUp mocking up the space that I had available and some of the constants. This included those upper cabinets that I was trying to line this all up to, the size of the mini fridge, and also the sustainers themselves. Then I moved on to working on the actual infrastructure of this whole system. I have a lot of leftover 2x6s from various projects, and so I decided to make all of these supports 2.5 inches wide by 1.5 inch width, and that's just so I could rip a 2x6 into two and get twice the linear amount of lumber for the same thing. And you'll see that I'm making kind of a box structure. I thought that this would be fine for the supports considering there will be drawer slides attached to the front and the back. And then I ended up putting panels on the outsides to try and make it look just a little bit nicer. I've really found SketchUp to be a valuable tool lately, even just making these boxes and understanding what dimensions I'm gonna need for a cut list certainly saves me a lot of time when time in the shop can be limited. If learning a couple of these shortcuts to do the same might be of interest to you, leave a comment below and I'd be happy to do a video just on the five basic things in SketchUp that help me take it to the next level quickly. Getting into the build video itself, if seeing an MFT table in track saw to break down dimensional lumber looks goofy to you, just know that it felt goofy to me. And correcting this is going to be an upcoming video soon. But for now, I used the track saw to break down all of the dimensional lumber to what I needed per my cut list from SketchUp. And then took everything over to the table saw to rip it down into two pieces of each. One thing I prefer to do when working with dimensional lumber is actually start by ripping the bull nose off of the lumber itself. This gives you pretty square ends as opposed to the rounded bull nose. Not quite as good as a joiner, but still better than nothing. After thinking that I wasn't mad at my dust collection system, just disappointed, I had all the pieces cut and ready to join together, and for this I'm obviously going with pocket screws. A shot project that no one but me is going to notice, definitely the right call. So after setting up my little system I have, which is clamping the jig to my workbench, I cranked through them. It felt like it took at least three days, when in actuality it was probably like 20 or 30 minutes. But I got those done and I used a little bit of my woodworking privilege and broke out my drum sander. Um, I had mentioned that I was going to make panels out of some of the end ones, and so I wanted to clean those up. And you can see here what a difference an unsanded one looks like versus a sanded one. And I'm glad I took the extra five minutes it took to do that. I ended up getting this new box joint blade, which is actually pretty cool the way that the teeth alternate. And what I was able to do was just make a perfectly quarter inch groove in the pieces and then a quarter inch panel fits nice and loose in there 
so that it's easy to do. And so I just made sure to line up all of the faces on the, on the table saw fence and cut those grooves. And then this is where the MFT table or a track saw really shines because I can rip the plywood on the table saw and then immediately cross cut it with the track saw and not have to go between two different setups to do it. Nothing too exciting with the assembly of the frames as I'm gonna call them. Just screwed in the bottom stretcher first, slid the panel in, and then screwed in the top stretcher on top of it. And then the middle pieces that didn't get the panel were the same process, but without that quarter inch sheet of plywood. Then I pre-drilled all of the frames to be mounted into the wall. And for this, the right angle attachment for my little install drill came in clutch because it was such a tight fit that the head of a drill wouldn't have made that clearance. And a quick tip here for anyone else who works alone a lot like I do, um, when you need a third hand to hold a level on a piece, it's pretty easy to just clamp it to the piece. Just make sure that the whole thing is flush so that you're not getting a biased reading. And instead of taking a measurement off of the first panel, I just put the fridge where I wanted it to be, lined the panel up accordingly so that the reveal was the same on each side, and went through the same process of clamping the level and screwing the panel in. Starting on the other wall, I knew how far I wanted it spaced out from the corner, so I put a block there and then attached all the rest of the panels. I cut a spacer for the dividers in between as well. That's what you'll see me here doing, putting that piece of plywood on the ground, getting the bottom flush with it, and then just leveling up through the top. And it went pretty smoothly this way. At this point, the frames were all connected pretty sturdy to the wall, and they were really strong from a downward perspective, but there was still a lot of side-to-side -side wiggle. I was originally planning on doing two layers of three-quarter inch plywood as a counter for this, but instead I decided to use these kind of furring strips to be the bottom layer of the, those two layers, and this was also going to help a lot with the racking. And so I just made sure that all these pieces were squared and then connected them basically to each other. And in a second, you'll see what it looks like from the whole perspective and how it's all connected together. I just used construction grade plywood for the tops for these. And I used a combination of the table saw and track saw to cut them down before clamping it and then screwing up through those furring strips into the bottom of the workbench. And this side, I wanted to get very close to level because it is going to be important for a future shop project that I have coming up, I think. Um, and you can see how off it is, at least initially. The left side was good, so I clamped it down to the furring strip and then worked on wedging the right side up. It did take quite a bit to shim it up, but eventually it got very level and I was happy with it. Um, it did leave a little bit of bowing in the middle though. And so what I did was come back with more shims where that bow could dip down a little bit just to put those in and take up that space. And a quick little pro tip for anybody working with shims, a lot of people use these razor blades to cut them off, but if you've got an oscillating tool, they just go so much faster and I think that they leave a cleaner cut at the end of the day too. The next thing that I wanted to work on was the drawer system that was going to be in here. And I just used 3 quarter inch plywood to make all of the sides, cut a 3 8 dado into each edge, put a 3 8 inch plywood panel in there as the base, and then glued and nailed the sides together. It ended up being a pretty rigid structure when it was all said and done. To install the drawers, I put a kind of spacer shim on the ground and then put the drawer slide right on top of it. This gave me a consistent placement on both of them. And then I just did a very similar thing with the drawer itself, put it on some spacers and then connected the drawer slides to them. And then it worked out well because the stainers are going in here and they're basically perfectly square. I could reference off the sustainer in the drawer below and just keep going up the same way. 
Unfortunately, after too long, I realized that these drawers stick out about a quarter of an inch from the supports. And while it's not a big deal, I thought it was definitely going to irritate me at some point. So I decided to rip all of the backs off and then glue on a piece that was a little bit smaller, making the drawers more shallow. And this actually held the sustainers a little bit better too because they were a little bit tighter fit in there. I always planned on using something to do an edge banding on the workbench itself. And so I had some pretty nice one by six pine left over. So I ripped it out and then I trimmed the workbench. I cut all the pieces at once, but because some of these pieces were so warped, I ended up using my biscuit joiner to actually cut into the trim pieces and the three quarter inch workbench top. And that helped align everything a lot working by myself on this. It was also the first time I actually used this, how it was designed to, and I'm already really enjoying this drawer system, being able to get at my tools quickly and then put them away just as quickly. I laid everything out and then adjusted the rest on the biscuit joiner. It's one of those tools where I don't use frequently enough to be real uh, fast with it, but it's great when I need it. The good thing about having a super small shop is that if your extension cord can't reach from one side to the middle of your shop, you just go to the other wall and you're bound to make it. quick dry fit and I almost didn't even need glue to hold this on. There was so much tension there that it stayed on by itself. But I ended up putting a pretty liberal amount of glue on there and then using the pin nails from my pin nailer to hold everything in place. And these holes are so small that you really don't see them in the first place, especially on a shop project. And it ended up turning out pretty nice, I thought. It's still construction grade plywood and pine, but all things considered, I think it looks like a pretty nice work top. As for finishing, I sanded it up to 220 over everything and then used this poly acrylic to finish the top. I used it on some furniture in my house and I liked the way that it held up. I put two coats of it on, hand sanded with 320 in between, vacuumed any dust off, and then applied one more coat. And that is just about a wrap on this project. It turned out really well, and I think that it fits everything that I was hoping that it would do. Um, if you enjoyed this video and you made it all the way through, I know shop organization and shop projects are a big thing on YouTube, and it's really what this channel is based around. So. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe to stay tuned for the upcoming shop projects, as well as check out what we have over here. I think you might like these ones too. Okay.